Good afternoon, everyone, dear colleagues and friends. I'm Ariel Liebman, Director of the Monash Energy Institute and Professor of Sustainable Energy Systems in the Faculty of IT uh, in the Department of Data Science and AI. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, our speaker today, um, Ms. Amro Farid. And uh, before I introduce him fully, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners and custodians of the lands, the unceded lands, where we are hosting this session today. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And um, this is a relatively um, recent uh, series of seminars uh, uh, restarted after many, uh, a few years of hiatus during the uh, COVID era. And um, we are getting people back on campus, um, getting speakers of interest to people from different disciplines, focusing on the issues and uh, interesting problems and research in the energy transition space, transition to a net zero renewable future, which the climate science tells us we have to reach by 2050 with um, and be halfway there by 2030 globally, which uh, is not that far away. That's eight years away. Um, and so um, this is an on-site only series, although we do have um, guests who are interstate or internationally joining us on Zoom from time to time. So welcome to those as well. So um, I'm very delighted to uh, introduce you to Professor Amro Farid, who or Amro M. Farid it says here, so I'm going to read properly, who has currently, oh, who currently holds several roles, such as the Alexander Crombie Humphreys Chair, Professor in Economics and Engineering at the School of Systems and Enterprises at the Stevens School, Stevens Institute of Technology, and visiting professor at MIT Mechanical Engineering, and currently Fulbright Scholar and CSIRO Visiting Scientist at CSIRO in Australia, which is just across the road. And research way. research way, that's right. And the Chief Executive Officer of Engineering System Analytics. He leads a laboratory for intelligent and creative networks of engineering systems, lines with two eyes, and uh, has authored over 150 peer-reviewed publications. As an academic, he has made active contributions to the MIT Mustard Institute Initiative, the MIT Future of Electricity Grid Study, the IEEE Vision for Smart Grid Control, and the Council for Engineering Systems, Univers Systems Universities. He currently serves as chair of IEEE Smart Cities R&D Technical Activities Committee and co-chair of the IEEE Systems Man, Man and Cybernetics. Is that right? Is that man? Oh. Systems Man and Cybernetics. Ah, oh, man. That, yeah, all right and cybernetics smc technical committee on intelligent industrial systems he and he is a senior member of ieee and a member of the asme american society of mechanical engineers and in cozy international council on systems engineering please join me to welcome professor amro m farid thank you ariel that, that was a very generous uh, introduction um and thank you all for inviting me to uh speak today uh am i audible to everyone uh here virtually and uh in person, okay. Um, if if not, then uh, particularly the virtual people, let, let us know through the uh, the chat. I, I should be able to uh, see if uh, if uh, if you can't hear me. So um, today I'm going to be talking to you about ducks on water: lessons learned from New England system operational analysis and renewable energy integration uh, studies. So let's um, advance this forward here. So first of all, a little bit about my lab. The Laboratory for Intelligent Integrated Networks of Engineering Systems is concerned with uh, a certain class, meta class of problems where you have one physical grid uh, and multiple layers of intelligent planning operations and control and uh, being integrated with Another grid, it could be the same grid, or but much more interestingly, uh, same type of grid, excuse me, um, but much more interestingly is if it's a fundamentally different type of grid with also its layers of planning operations and control, and you want to integrate them together. And there are all sorts of different types of problems that fit into this class. Um, and so smart power grids is one, uh, energy water nexus, electrified transportation, uh, industrial energy management, and uh, when you start to recognize that you're looking at electric power and water and transportation and, and industrial supply chains and integrating them together, it puts you in a really good place to begin to study interdependent smart city infrastructures. And the reason why my lab has focused on these particular problems more than uh, others that fit into 
this broad class is actually their importance to the sustainable energy transition. So if you were going to do a Pareto analysis of like, what are the big problems? What are the tough nuts that we got to crack right away first in order to address this impending climate change challenge? Um, you would recognize very quickly that you need to address electric power, energy, water, nexus, electrified transportation, and um, and supply chains. And cities are actually a really uh, interesting problem because uh, we have this uh, human habit of uh, urbanizing and putting huge quantities of our population onto relatively small um, plots of uh, of land. A quick acknowledge acknowledgement for the various funders of, uh, of our lab over the years. So my goal today is to share some lessons from two different case studies, operational analysis and renewable energy integration studies conducted in cooperation with ISO New England. ISO New England is an electric power system that serves the six states of New England. Uh, that would be Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and, um, and Maine. It's the smallest um, uh, independent system operator or transmission system operator in the, the United States, but it's about the same size as the NEM here. So we're dealing with a peak load of around 25 gigawatts. Um, so what we're gonna do today is talk about drivers for the evolution of the electric power grid. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, the ISO New England Renewable Energy Integration Study. Um, and then, uh, and then a follow-on study where we try to look at uh, the energy water nexus in, in New England um, using an evolved version of the, the software. And then that should set, up, set us up to look ahead to intelligent multi-energy engineering systems and why, that's, uh, and why that's so important. So, you know, when I got here to uh, Australia by virtue of the uh, Fulbright Award. And very shortly thereafter, we had this rather interesting event in the news, which is that the Australian energy market operator suspended the spot market for the first time in, uh, well, the lifetime of the, of the market. And um, it was, you know, all over the, the news I turned on. I, I was actually quite amazed at the level of um, uh, discourse in the nation, right? Uh, I'm saying this as a, as a visiting uh, American citizen. I'm like, wow, they're talking about some really cool stuff on the news as, as an energy wonk type of person. Um, so this is just my, my uh, like personal feeling um, that you know, the debate is front and center and people are actually talking about things in a, in a, in a reasonable way. Um, but nevertheless, the question persists. Can business as usual persist? And Ariel started the um, uh, today's proceedings with the with the impending question of climate science and uh, telling us that we need to decarbonize by fifty um, percent by twenty thirty. And um, so, can we do what we've always done in terms of operating the electric uh, electric power grid? And you know. Interestingly, what inevitably happens is that um, is that you get these different camps that will, you know, sort of point the finger at each other and, and say, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, these emergency situations happen because of it's all the renewables or it's because of all of the aging infrastructure. And, you know, I'm not here today to say, oh, it's one or the other, but I what I will say is that it stands to reason that if you can operate the grid well without the market, which is exactly what happened, right? The, the uh, Australian energy market operator um, turned off the markets and went to manual mode to operate the grid, uh, but can't, uh, can't with the market, that means that you do need to fix the market to, um, uh, to, improve, its, uh, to improve its operation. So what's really going on with our grid is that we have an evolution of the electric power grid. And so our traditional electric power systems were built upon many assumptions, many of, uh, but perhaps the one that is uh, most important here is that generation was controlled by few, relatively few centralized generation facilities that were designed to serve fairly passive loads. And now we have a number of drivers that are challenging this assumption, decarbonization at the top of the list, 
um, disruptive electricity demand and disruptive means different things in different regions. So in OEC developed nations, just having flat demand or even declining demand is disruptive because utilities depend upon the growth of demand to evolve uh, our infrastructure. But in other nations that are, let's say with rapid population growth, then uh, very quickly growing electricity demand can be uh, a real challenge. Deregulation of electricity markets with active end user part participation and things like demand response and uh, digital innovations as well uh, in our energy technology. So that means we've got to step out from the traditional way of doing things and sort of think back as to how do we frame the problem. And the way I like to think about this is that we have a supply chain of generation, transmission, distribution, demand as one axis that we need to be aware of. And then we have multiple layers of cyber layers of control planning operations, markets, and regulations that sit on top of that. And then we have to also recognize that the physical resources that of which this supply chain is made are dispatchable and stochastic in nature as well. And making that distinction is actually really important. We have a number of quote unquote control objectives. Some are technical in nature or physical. Uh, and an electric power systems engineer would be able to rattle them off very quickly, balancing um, and when, with frequency control, line congestion and uh, control, and voltage control. And then on the economic level, there is the investment and economic costs as well. Thank you for joining. Um, so there is an evolution of the electric power grid, and one of the very first uh, experiences that I had uh, very fortunately as an academic was the MIT Future of the Electric Grid study. And, and it talked about how the grid would evolve in the future. And even though it came out in, in 2011, it still has a lot of relevance today. And one particular quote uh, stands out to me and, um, and seems quite timeless. And I like to read it here. It says, opportunities for improving the functioning and reliability of the grid arise from technological developments in sensing, communications, control, and power electronics. These technologies can enhance efficiency and reliability, increase capacity utilization, enable more rapid response to remediate contingencies, and increase flexibility in controlling power flow flows on transmission lines. If properly deployed and accompanied by appropriate policies, this is a rather large tip, they can deal effectively with some of the challenge described, challenges described above. They can facilitate the integration of large volumes of renewable and distributed generation, provide greater visibility of the instantaneous state of the grid, and make possible the engagement of demand as a resource. So what we have here is that you have your grandfather's grid, the Edison grid, uh, with few well-controlled dispatchable uh, generation facilities meeting the conventional loads, which are generally slow-moving, highly predictable, always served. And so we're moving from that picture to a picture that looks more like this two by two matrix. And, and what we're gonna be doing is integrating a lot more solar and wind. And uh, so that's coming up. Uh, these are stochastic in nature. They can cause unmanaged grid imbalances if we're not uh, careful. Um, naturally, if you have a lot more generation here, then there can be an erosion of the capacity factor of th thermal units. And there's also an erosion of the dispatchability of the grid as well. And if you get to really, really high levels of renewable energy integration, then you're going to be looking for new levers of dispatchability, new levers of control. And you start to recognize, well, where am I going to get it from? Well, the, the last remaining corner of, uh, of this two by two matrix, the demand side uh, resources, which inevitably requires new control and new market design. And coming back to maybe the question of the Australian energy market operator, as I was turning on ABC, there was this one moment where um, uh, I forget which minister asked the Australian public to, you know, turn down their, uh, their thermostats during uh, particularly high peak times, and it was considered like a big faux pas. And um, and I would encourage us to recognize whether that is actually a faux pas or not if we're gonna be thinking about incentivized demand response in the future. The other thing we need to recognize is that the electric power system, as, 
Ariel and I were talking before um, uh, before today's presentation is a multi time scale type of system, and so if we were to take a uh, look at electric power load and look at it in the frequency domain, we would see something that looks like like this with uh, with multiple peaks. Naturally, there's a certain cyclicity associated with days and then half days and then down to hours and, and so forth, so on. And if you're running your system based upon this load spectrum, then all of a sudden you might recognize that I'm going to bring in solar power and wind power, which have very different types of um, frequency components than, uh, than the load does. And so you're going to need a multi time scale approach if you're going to be integrating solar wind with, your, with load for a net load shape. And that's why we developed in over the years what we call electric power enterprise control system simulation. And the way it works, and I'm not going to get into any mathematics today. Hopefully that doesn't upset any of you. So um, the way it works is that there's a rather sophisticated day ahead security constrained unit commitment model optimization here. Uh, and that's followed by an intraday security const constraint, what it's called real time unit commitment um, model here. Uh, and ICE New England has that as something internal. And then followed by a real time market or security constrained economic dispatch model running in here followed by a regulation service, um, which is automatic generation control uh, in steady state, and then a model of the physical power, gr power grid, which in, uh, for these simulations is the power flow analysis model. We're gonna be running simulations that last for a full day with time steps of one minute. So, this, you know, your day ahead, your day ahead market is as a time step of one hour with a look ahead horizon of, of 24 hours. And then that gets, you know, crunched down further and further and further all the way down to when you get to the regulation service interacting with the physical power grid with, with one minute time steps. That's half a million time steps over the course of a year. So it took us a while to develop the methodologies for uh, electric power enterprise control system simulation, and then naturally the software development that comes along uh, with it, published all of those papers, and then we convinced ICE New England that it, they should be running their, um, their case studies with this software. So what did we learn along the way? Well, interestingly, when you do a, uh, a case study with a very large grid operator like an ICE New England or like an AMO, um, this is real life, so it's a stakeholder uh, process. You're not going to use the full transmission system that's here on, uh, on the left. That would be you know, critical infrastructure uh, data, but you want to engage a lot of stakeholders in the process. So you, you boil this down into uh, what uh, ICE New England calls for stakeholders a pipe and bubble model, which is basically a reduced order DC um, power flow analysis type uh, type model with 19 different um, bubbles and pipes that go along with them. And, uh, and then you design 12 different scenarios, not we designed, but rather the stakeholders designed 12 different scenarios, six for hypothetical 2025 scenarios and six for hypothetical 2030 scenarios. These are not predictions of the future, but scenarios that we were, that are designed by consensus. And what we often ask is, or what I'm often asked is, how much renewables, uh, you know, did you simulate? Well, the high scenarios, uh, we have some sort of like business as usual scenarios like um, 2025 conventional over here. And then we have very high renewable cases, uh, which go up to uh, about 80% um, based upon nameplate capacity um, installation. And we'll come back to this, but please keep in mind how much you install is very different than how much you end up using. Uh, it, one is measured in power, units of power. I'm gonna have a hundred megawatt wind turbine, but how many megawatt hours is it going to get, give me over the course of over a year? That's a very different question because that comes from the dispatch of the market. 
So one of the things that we have to look at very carefully is the net load shape. So over the span of a year, we have a blue shape that is electric power consumption. And in a geography like ice in New England, um, it tends to be the highest in the summer months for air conditioning. But there's also a good amount of con uh, consumption for heating in, uh, in the winter months. Of course, we're in the northern hemisphere. And, we could, and then, of course, as you add solar and wind, that is going to be generation. So it's going to pull the shape down. And then the other thing we want to do is we want to be able to look at this, um, this net load shape, this time series, in a bunch of different ways. So one of the ways that's interesting is to do a load duration curve. And if you're not familiar with a load duration curve, the way it works is that you take the highest numbers here and you move them all the way to the left and you take the lowest numbers and move them over to the right so that they're fully sorted. And you get something, um, a shape like this called a load duration curve. And so you can say something like, um, you know, for 3% of the year, we have uh, a net load shape that is more than 20,000 um, 20, megawatts or 20 gigawatts. And then another way of analyzing this time series is that is as a uh, probability distribution. And as you might expect, we have our uh, load shape. And then when we add solar and wind, it gets shifted to, uh, to the left. And we're going to pay attention to this, uh, to these load and net load shapes very carefully for very good reason. Because I just showed a sort of business as usual case, which is very like well behaved. But let's take a look at the a high renewables case and what happens here. So let's take a look at this load duration curve here and the net load shape. And what we see is for about 15% of the year, you have negative net load. What are you going to do when you have a lot of excess generation? Um, and you don't know what to do with it. One of the important assumptions of the study was that we have about 3.2 gigawatts of nuclear power generation that is gonna be considered must run. You gotta keep it always on. And so our effective net zero line of um, is actually 3.2 gigawatts. And so here, about 35% of the year, you're gonna have excess generation. And the question is, well, what do you do in those conditions to keep the grid balanced? And that's gonna be a tough situation. So you run your simulation and you can do the, the dispatch at the day ahead, the interday, and then the real time, and you're gonna get uh, results that sort of look like this. This is a 2025 conventional uh, scenario. And you have at the bottom of your quote unquote stack, nuclear power generation, and then followed by the various forms of fossil generation. And then you have solar and wind up here. For those of you who have been doing this type of work before, this is the perennial duck curve. And the duck is, even on a business as usual case, um, quacking uh, quite in a quite healthy way. Um, it's now become the norm. Uh, it might have been news in 2014 when California ISO came up with the duck curve. But by 2025, even in a business as usual case, this is uh, something that we'll be, have to be ready for. But let's take a look at a high uh, renewables case, 2030. What's going on here? I call it the duck dive curve, right? So we have our nuclear power generation and then our, our dispatchable thermoelectric fleet is actually ramping quite a bit in the morning uh, and then ramping right back down and sometimes appearing uh, the head of the duck sometimes appears in the evening, but um, but not always so. And then you have these two very bright, um, warm colors to reflect solar and wind. And what's what's interesting and sometimes not often about is that solar and wind in many geographies are not aligned with each other. So um, so solar obviously during the peak of the day is when you get the most generation, and um, and oftentimes wind is greatest as your um, as the sun is, uh, is setting. But nevertheless, it means that we're going to need a lot of grid flexibility or the generation fleet is going to have to be rather flexible in providing reserves and responding to the net load up and down as, as necessary. And so we need to quantify 
that flexibility, and we do so with a number of different formal terms, which I'll introduce now. One of them is called load following reserves. And load following reserves means that if the market tells you to dispatch your 500 megawatt units at 400 megawatts, then you have 100 megawatts of upward load following reserves. Market operators sometimes call this headroom. And then, uh, and then you have maybe a minimum capacity that you can go down to, which is 200 megawatts. So that leaves 200 megawatts of downward load following reserves, which is sometimes called legroom. So in a business as usual case, let's have a look at load following reserves and, and um, in the upward and downward direction. One of the easiest ways to look at it is to just go straight to the distributions and we get some really nice healthy distributions in that you have a good amount of load following reserves and a good amount of, of downward reserves. The nature of the shapes is really quite different because you tend to pay more for the upward ones because you have to buy capacity. But nevertheless, you have some nice space around the zero line here, which means that you have neither exhausted your upward nor uh, your upward uh, load following reserves nor exhausted your downward load following reserves. So that's great. What about in 2030, we add a whole bunch of renewables onto, onto the grid and look at what has happened to these shapes. There are times in the year where you have exhausted both the upward and the load following reserves. And in this case, actually, uh, the upward load following reserves are um, uh, have been exhausted for a good portion of the uh, of the time. And so this is kind of like a, to make a Star Trek reference, pull up Scotty, right? And you're not getting what you need uh, from the grid. Now, it's not just about capacity. It's also about ramping as well. And so we were talking about uh, load following reserves, we were at 400 megawatts. And let's say that this generation facility uh, in the next time step needs to go up to 425 megawatts. But if you floor it, you could go all the way up to 450. So it's providing you with 25 megawatts per hour of upward ramping reserves. And, um, and then if, you, if for some reason you needed to really pull the generator back, you could go down to 340 megawatts. So now you have 25 megawatts per hour of upward uh, ramping reserves, and you have 85 megawatt, um, megawatts per hour of downward uh, ramping reserves. So we have to track these ramping reserves as well in the, in the simulator. So again, in our conventional business as usual scenario, we look at the distributions and we see that we have plenty of ramping reserves upward and downward throughout the whole year. So we're feeling fairly comfortable about that. And then we add the renewables in this uh, high quantities of renewables in the 2030 scenario. And what we find is that they have been exhausted. And it's worthwhile asking when in particular are these ramping reserves and load falling reserves most um, most constrained or uh, least apparent? And the answer is, and again, we're talking about nor Northern Hemisphere, is in this, particularly in the spring and to a certain degree also in the fall months. And, and the reason for that, let's think about the spring, we're in this Australian spring right now, is that the days are relatively long. There are, there's a good amount of solar generation but the temperature is more or less temperate. So you have not, uh, you don't have a ton of um, load from, uh, from cooling. You don't have a ton of load from, from heating, but you have a ton of generation because the days are long uh, from solar generation. And, and, uh, and so this situation of having excess generation actually causes a, um, uh, some difficulty in terms of grid operation. The last type of grid flexibility uh, or operating reserves is regulation reserves, and that's in your automatic generation control. This is a closed feedback loop that measures grid frequency, and if, and if the frequency dips below the nominal frequency in the United States, 60 hertz, dips below, then it commands more generation to bring the the frequency back up to 60 Hertz and then the opposite in the, in the opposite direction. So you might have a certain dispatch set point and you have a regulation limit that are basically saturation limits, maybe 
50 megawatts in uh, in the ice New England um, uh, uh, region. It's it's actually a very small number considering if peak load is around 25 gigawatts, then they would run with let's say 120 megawatts of regulation. So that's pretty small peanuts. So let's look at the regulation reserves for the high renewables uh, scenarios or the 2030 scenarios. What goes on here? Let's look at it from a duration curve. So we have some business as usual 2030 scenarios where the duration curve has this like nice sort of um, uh, nice shape. It doesn't look saturated in, in any way, but as we go to scenarios that have more and more and more renewables, the regulation on in the upward direction gets very saturated, right? By the, the presence of this horizontal line. So, um, so if you had more regulation reserves, this you know this shape would like come come straight up. But because it's artificially constrained by how much regulation reserves you you have purchased, um, it ends up being saturated like this. And that's um, certainly cause for some some concern from a reliability perspective. So what happens if you run out of load following reserves or, reg or ramping reserves or regulation reserves? Where do you get the grid flexibility from? And the answer is curtailment. And so in, uh, again, looking at the 2030 scenarios, one of the things that the simulator will allow you to do is to say, okay, that solar and wind, we can curtail it down from the level that it was forecasted to generate. So in a fairly low renewables case, there isn't any curtailment at all. Actually, if you were to talk to uh, an energy market operator like ICE New England today, do we use curtailment as an important lever of grid flexibility in the answer or dispatchability? The answer is no, definitely not. Because it would look something a lot like this, where there's hardly any curtailment. As you bring more and more renewables onto the grid, then, then curtailment becomes much more important. And in this particular case, let's read the duration curve very carefully. In the worst case, you're curtailing about 14 gigawatts, 14 and a half gigawatts of curtailment uh, in the worst case. And since this is units of power and this is units of time, then this part of the curve is the amount of energy that you're spilling over the course of the year, and it ends up being about 40% in this worst case. So that means if I had a wind turbine that I was expecting to run for a capacity factor of 50%, uh, then because of grid operation, I'm gonna throw away 40% of that 50%, and it's gonna leave me with 30%, and that's now a very expensive wind turbine. Um, I might've not built it in the first place. And that's a, Another cause for concern from an economic perspective. The other thing that happens is that solar and wind inevitably are not where people are. So in the ISO New England region, we placed the solar and wind generation where there was greatest potential for solar and wind. So where is that? Um, well, as it turns out, the greatest potential for wind is in, in uh, the state of Maine, where hardly anyone lives. And that means you need to bring the wind generation from these sparsely populated areas down to the load centers of New England, uh, which would be like Boston or close to Southwestern Connecticut, which is right next to New York City. So that means that certain lines are gonna become particularly constrained. So let's look at them, look at this congestion. And again, sort of, nice, beautiful shapes without a lot of renewables um, for uh, interface flows. But the moment you start adding a lot of renewables, we see a lot of congestion on the upper, uh, upper side of these, um, uh, of these interfaces or these um, sort of uh, virtualized lines. And, uh, and what that means there is that uh, if I want all the renewables, then I have to expand transmission to accordingly. And in particular, in, in this case, the north-south congestion, which is the from Maine down to, uh, down to Boston. So we have a bunch of things going on here. Um, the, 
the grid flexibility in terms of operating reserves is actually a very complex phenomenon because the, the unit commitment of the day ahead and intraday markets are changing the amount of um, load falling reserves and ramping reserves that you have. And it's rather difficult to predict, hence the need for simulation. The upward and load falling reserves can be exhausted by high renewable scenarios. And when you get to scenarios where the load falling and ramping reserves uh, and also regulation reserves are exhausted, then you come to rely on your curtailment as your last line of defense. And you, hence all of that hard work to integrate the solar and wind gets spilled uh, in as a matter of reliable uh, operation. And it can have an impact on um, balancing uh, as well. Well, so I started this, uh, this talk by asking, can business as usual persist? And what this simulation uh, case study says is no, it, it really can't um, because we're gonna have to figure out how to address this, this curtailment balancing and economic question simultaneously. And we could do so with expanding transmission capacity, uh, treating curtailment as a type of operating reserve that ultimately is monetized and has, has uh, financial value. We can procure more regulation reserves. Um, this already happens coordinating the, the maintenance of nuclear power generation facilities and then expanding the role of energy storage, but perhaps more importantly, demand side, uh, demand side resources because we need more grid flexibility in one way or another. Before I, um, and we're, you know, quick, two slides of plugs before I move on, the Electric Power Enterprise Control System Simulator is the, um, is the key product of engineering systems analytics, my, uh, uh, my company, my software uh, development firm and, and engineering consultancy. Um, so we, we've now licensed this, licensed this to ICE in New England for several years to come. The most recent version of this case study actually came out a couple of weeks ago. And uh, for those of you who are real electric power system uh, fanatics, uh, we have developed a globally optimal solution to AC optimal power flow. Happy to talk about this. Uh, this paper it came out at the very end of last year. So we said, okay, we want more demand side resources. And what would be the value of those demand side resources? And that was effectively the question that we got from the United States Department of Energy. They posed it in a particularly interesting way. They said, what if we were to look at energy water resources and understand what value can energy water resources um, provide to the grid in terms of physical reliability, economic benefits, and environmental benefits? So, what we're trying to do is say, let's get this corner of the demand side resources from resources that sit at the intersection of energy and water together. And if you look at a map of where generation facilities are sited in, um, in the New England region, you would immediately realize that actually energy and water are really quite in, inextricably tied. Um, for, for so many reasons. And also if you're a mechanical engineer, then um, that would become also really obvious to you. So what we did was we expanded the system boundary so that we can study not just the grid in terms of electrical variables, but also keeping track of water withdrawals, water consumption, and look there, looking at this entire system boundary, this yellow system boundary, and all the flows that cross it. The way we set up the study was instead of looking at 2030 scenarios, we, we advanced the, um, the resource fleet out to 2040 and looked at six scenarios. And then we studied them um, with flexible energy water resources. Those are incentivized to be flexible by virtue of demand response and those that are, uh, are not. So these energy water resources include hydro run of river. So, um, this is not your traditional hydro. This is where you have a river and you have a turbine and you can flex the mode of the, uh, the hydro. You have your pumped storage and then you have water loads where you look at electric power consumption devoted for 
water pumping in water utilities. Um, and we're not looking at huge quantities here in, on a percent basis of, uh, of peak load, only you know, uh, six to 8% for the, the various scenarios. And we wanna know what value um, those flexible energy water resources can provide. And I'm gonna to cut to the chase and give a balanced sustainability scorecard. So in terms of balancing performance, you actually get a lot of benefit right away. All of these are positive improvements. In other words, there are no trade-offs. These are synergies. Uh, we have an improvement in the quantities of load following reserves, of ramping reserves, um, and of, uh, of the imbalances as well. And then we also have improvements of water withdrawals, water consumption, and CO2 emissions. And then we also have improvements in the production costs in the two markets, the day ahead and the real-time uh, markets to the tune of somewhere between 20 and $70 million per year. And you haven't done any new sort of installation of uh, technologies, you've just changed the way the markets work. So why is it that we get these uh, types of results? So let's try to get a sense of the intuition of what's going on here. So uh, the load following uh, reserves in the various scenarios, and we've looked at them in terms of these distributions, um, probably the easiest one is like this one down here. Let's, let's have a look. Um, the, the load following reserves in the conventional case, which is red, is again, kind of like, you know, uh, looks kind of tight. And then what happens when you add energy water resources that are flexible, they end up providing you with load following reserves. So it expands out. There's no surprise to that. That makes sense that as you're giving um, new grid flexibility or making these resources dispatchable, then you're gonna get load following reserves from them. So that's to be expected. And ramping reserves work in the, uh, in the same way as well. Again, this red line shifts out to the black line uh, over there. And that's pretty much the case across, uh, across the board. But then you say, well, what's happening with, uh, with water withdrawals? Well, the water withdrawals are improving as well. And what's going on is that the grid flexibility is allowing for more renewables to come onto the grid. And solar generation and wind generation do not require the consumption of water, which means that they're displacing thermoelectric facilities, which do consume or withdraw water. And so you get an improvement in the uh, the water environment uh, as well. So water withdrawals also improve. In terms of the improvements in the, um, in the production costs, the reason why you get improvements there is because you're bringing on solar and wind, which uh, don't have any operating costs. So the more you can bring them onto the grid, the more you're going to end up reducing your, uh, your production costs. They have costs and in investment, but they don't have any costs in operations. So once you've installed them, you might as well use them as much as you possibly can. So this is an interesting story because what we're recognizing is that we want to decarbonize the grid. We want to put as much solar and wind and hydro renewable sources onto the grid as, as possible. But when we do so, we lose flexibility. And so we need to look at the demand side. But the demand side doesn't just exist in the grid alone, it's connected to these other infrastructures, whether it's our water system or it is connected to uh, transportation in the form of electric vehicles and so forth. And so what this story is telling us is that we need to be moving away from a purely electric power systems approach to decarbonization to assist to modes of analysis that look at multi-energy engineering systems. And so I'm gonna just leave you with a couple of concluding thoughts. One of, uh, one of which is that we've been working for several years on developing the American multimodal energy system model. And this is a socio-technical model that consists of 
four infrastructures, coal not shown. Um, this here is our natural gas infrastructure. This is our oil infrastructure. This is our electric power systems infrastructure. And it's an open access, socio-technical, um, heterofunctional graph model because you need something that will address the interconnectivity of unlike things. To develop an, an American multimodal energy system. Uh, and we are doing it in a data driven way, uh, recognizing the existing infrastructure. And so we use physically informed machine learning to do it. Um, and, and so it's my hope that we expand our methodologies beyond just electric power systems to methodologies that are fundamentally multi energy in nature. And by the way, that's its own. Uh, own talk that I give uh, as well. So I'll stop here and uh, and hopefully that gives you a sense of how do we get there when it comes to uh, decarbonization and meeting our 2050 goals. Thank you very much, Amro. Um, yeah, time for questions. Uh, I've got lots of questions. It's very exciting to see what uh, and uh, really close to in my own interests and interest of some of the people here. But you know, let's let let's go to questions. Um, maybe how do we get the um, uh, the people online on Zoom um, to show up? Is this which machine are we looking at? Oh yeah, it's that one. I think that view. There's, oh, there's one chat person here. And that was me. Oh, that was you. If you go up to view. So if you stop sharing, we'll stop no, no. Oh well, yes. anyway, we can do that. All right. So, um, any, anybody online? We'll, we'll we'll might as well start yeah. with online for a change. David, is that you? Yeah. Um. Well, a, a couple of comments and questions, but great talk. Uh, uh, Amro, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, but I'll firstly ask you if you happen to know Yi Guo, who was uh, in my group many, many years ago at Yee. Stevens Institute. Professor Yi Guo. Uh, a... Oh, no. no. Um, okay. uh, are they still there? She's a power systems person at Stevens. Um, uh, any, I have anyway. not yet met everyone there because I'm a new, uh, okay. I'm a new professor there. I haven't had a chance to meet everyone yet. Okay. Anyway, your talk has great timing. I, I'm actually you're, uh, listening to it interrupted my uh, preparation of a consulting report for the New South Wales government where I'm laying down all my fears um, of the, um, uh, the assumptions being made about how all these different new technologies and mechanisms are going to work to uh, keep the lights on. And, um, and one of the things that we encountered when we started interviewing people was in the market was, oh, it actually worked in manual mode. Um, it, was, it was kind of like a surprise. Oh, you know, that you don't need actually the market to make uh, things, uh, things work. And, and I noticed in your quote from MIT that markets are not even mentioned. So there's a bit of controversy at the moment. We have eight frequency control markets and we have a number of network support and black start markets. And now we've got economists and policy people and so on talking about the possibility of inertia markets and even system strength markets. Mm -hmm. So what we used to call system control is now exploding into a, um, a, a large collection of markets where people are going to bid with less certainty about what they can deliver, it seems to me. So th there's an emerging complexity that I'm just not sure that we're going to be on, on top of. So your talk kind of addresses that, but I'd be interested to see uh, hear what you think about that possible future scenario of so many markets interacting. And then um, you mentioned multi-energy systems. 
Can, that can I address maybe, yeah, sure. maybe the first Let's question? Because uh, yeah. it, uh, it's its own can of, uh, can of worms. So if, if you were to go to, uh, uh, let's say, a traditional electric power systems uh, curriculum, uh, not to mention literature, what, what you would find is that, uh, I wouldn't say all, but most of the work looks at individual markets, uh, individual optimization programs, and, and studies those, and maybe de designs each market uh, on its own. Uh, like we learn about AC optimal power flow, DC optimal power flow, dist flow. We learn about economic dispatch, security constraint, economic dispatch, unit commitment, and so forth, so on. And, uh, and that's kind of like the canon of electric power systems. But I think what this work is emphasizing is that it's the interactions of the markets together in what we call an electric power enterprise uh, that determines how well we are going to be able to decarbonize effectively, that is decarbonize and actually bring about carbon reductions, or actually maintain the reliability of the grid and, and actually bring about uh, economic efficiencies. Or, and it's not achieved by any one market, but actually the interactions of the markets together. And, and so one of the, um, one of the axes that I've been grinding for many years now is that we have to be careful about not just designing any one market in isolation, but rather studying them together and simulating them together. Because if you do just one at a time, then it's actually very possible that you don't get what you were intending to get. Um, and that's kind of the, in a sense, the subtext and, and one of the more deeper insights to um, thinking about long-term market design for, um, for various regions, whether it's Australia or New England or otherwise. Yeah, very good. Um, well, I'm pleased to hear that such work is happening. We need a bit more of that, I believe, in Australia. Um, Ariel, I can ask one more question or just wait until I have had a go. Yes, I'm Our Ariel now. Uh, moderator has stepped out. I am Ariel for the moment. Yes, please do ask another question. <laughs> oh, well, I, I like the second part of your talk because that sort of grounded the whole thing in all these inter physical interdependencies. And you might be interested to hear one that came up in the market suspension where we had a we have a, a big hydro scheme, the Snowy, um, and it was put in a very unusual situation of kind of needing to run continuously. So we had a massive interdependency between water, electricity, and actually agriculture. Mm -hmm. Because we've had lots of rain, so the dams are full, and um, uh, so there's not much what they call airspace, to, you know, which is kind of like the size of the battery. And um, so they had problems getting spillage in order to make airspace because spillage creates floods. Um, so all these interactions um, in the wash up need revisiting um, uh, because of the interdependencies that you're talking about. And of course, in the, in the end, it's, it's water transport. It, and we have telco issues, issues in, um, in emergency situations which came up. So yeah, the multi-energy or maybe beyond the multi-energy and into the multi-infrastructure um, uh, is, is, is an important part of the uh, future uh, security. Yeah, so th this, um, so one of the consistent themes in my, my work is, is systems of systems. Uh, the, the energy water nexus problem is one that is remarkably understudied. Yep. Uh, it's only really about a decade old in the grand scheme of things, looking at the energy water nexus in terms of computational approaches uh, at the system of systems level. And I'm right there with you. I couldn't agree more uh, with 
uh, Snowy Hydro here in, in Australia. Uh, let me offer a couple of other very relevant anecdotes, particularly if you're uh, gonna put in a report to uh, show that this is not purely an Australian phenomenon. In, I mentioned in New England that we get away with having uh, about 125 megawatts of regulation service to our 25 gigawatts of, uh, of peak load. And how is it that the grid operator is able to do so so effectively with such a tiny little amount of regulation, right? And the answer is, is that we have 2.3 gigawatts of pumped hydro storage that we use at will to really a big, huge battery, if, if you will, water battery that serves to balance the grid. And, um, and we rely on that tremendously in order to make the grid um, function in a reliable way. Now, if you talk to the pumped hydro operators, and also um, Great River Hydro, which is the, um, uh, there are six different hydropower plants on the Connecticut River from Connecticut all the way down to Long Island Sound. Um, you will find that they have to do a lot of prediction of snowpack. Obviously it's a very snowy region, um, snowpack uh, to uh, determining the releases of water in um, uh, on the Connecticut River and the various rivers that are in, uh, in New England. And we've had a lot of variability in snow from one year to uh, the next, and that's only going to continue to, uh, to change. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that grid reliability is directly dependent upon precipitation in our respective uh, regions. And I'm gonna give you two more examples that are really important. Uh, in the American West, we've talked about drought conditions in, in California. Snowpack in the uh, snowpack in Northern California does not just affect the availability of water in aquifers and, um, and even bringing the water down to LA, which has basically no water for itself, but it also is used to address hydropower and the balancing of huge quantities of solar integration in the California ISO region. And, uh, and then the, the other one, I was speaking to a Peruvian colleague of mine, um, uh, the former president of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and he was telling me that, uh, that the changes in El Nino and La Nina in the, um, in the Eastern Pacific, which is off the west coast of the Americas, uh, has changed the, the precipitation hitting the Andes Mountains and uh, the operation of the electric power grid in, in Peru. So this is a universal problem that is really not well studied, nor um, are we preparing our students unless we get them to think in a multidisciplinary way, right? Where they are capable of looking at hydraulic flows with electrical flows and thermodynamic flows in between. Yeah, very, very interesting examples. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I usually say these days that we're dealing with a, an end-to-end -end energy management problem totally embedded in the weather, changing weather system. So it's pretty complicated. <laughs> anyway, thank you, uh, Amro, for your comments. Thanks, Amro. Thanks, David. Yeah, thanks, um, David. Great questions. So I don't know if um, I mentioned that David's joining us at Monash uh, soon. He's coming back, coming over from New South Wales um, okay. to take up a position here to help us build up our power systems capabilities and uh, work across with computer scientists and economists and others. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really exciting time. Well, I hope I haven't good. upset the economists with my comment. <laughs> Well, I don't think there are any online, so okay. we'll see what they say when they watch the video online. Um, Nothing like a bit of healthy debate and and um, putting people's feet to the fire a bit and accountable for. I mean, ultimately, yeah. I mean, what we're what we're talking about is these multiple objectives together, right? Yeah. And and so 
you really have to put multiple disciplines together in order to achieve what it is that we're looking for. Indeed. So any, any other questions? Any more? Like, that was just one question, so we, we, we should have a few more. Da uh, Roger, hang on. It's, it's more a question of, of uh, clarification. When, when you were talking about the energy water nexus, so normally in your energy system model, you just dispatch the resources in the most economic fashion to have least, mm -hmm. least system costs. So when, when you did the water energy nexus, did you put a, a value on the water no. or some, some kind of constraint so that the water resources were optimally dispatched for both the value of the water and the value of the power? No, what, all, all, we, all we did was we said, and I'm not saying that this is optimal in any way or, or the best uh, market design. What we said is given the existing market and, uh, with, and given the existing market, which allows for demand response, if these energy water resources were to enter into the market as demand side resources, and they had the ability to be incentivized to change their, let's say their pumping schedules, um, then what would be the benefit to the grid? And would that also lead to improvements in, you know, uh, in environment and, and, and cost? Now, uh, all of these markets could do a whole lot better if they had things like, you know, um, the cost of water or the cost of, of carbon, you know, uh, not even on the table, right, uh, in, in, the, in the United States, but they could do a lot better if we actually had, um, uh, you know, things in the objective function that realize that uh, carbon has real cost, water has uh, real cost, but that's not what we've done here. We, it, it was more practical using what we have right now as markets. Yeah. If you look at the, the Snowy scheme in Australia, for example, it was actually built as a water management system. Mm -hmm. The electricity that comes out of it is just a bonus. a bonus. Right. And so the operators of Snowy have multiple constraints. They're oh, ma managing that very valuable water resource, trying to provide power. And then you end up with interesting um, constraints where recently we had huge amounts of water falling from the sky, flooding events. Right. And you think, okay, well, it's, bad for flooding but it's great for the hydro resources until you find out that once the downstream rivers are flooding you can't actually release water from your hydro system because it exacerbates the flooding right. so you know, again these you know, additional constraints on your hydro resources coupled with these extreme climate events make yeah. managing the systems really complicated so uh en energy uh, 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 uh this is a passion of mine and uh, energy systems folk don't tend to look at hydropower facilities. Ooh, I have a battery I have, and I'm going to use it for all of these great reliability and balancing functions. And, um, and they neglect that it's part of the water system. And they tend to neglect also water quality issues. I'll give you, uh, and I speak a lot to a lot of hydrologists. One of my hydrologist friends told me, you can have a pumped hydro storage, which will have constraints on the flows of pumping water back up because you can have invasive spe species on the bottom that you don't want to push up if you have too much volumetric flow up, right? And that's not the type of thing that a typical energy systems or even electric power systems would even think might even be possible. And, and so the expansion of the disciplinary boundary and the system boundary is something that we really need to make sure that we emphasize as we go forward. Students, students, yeah. Would you like to ask some questions to your students? There must be some good questions. No? Oh, okay, fair. Online. Oh, yes. thanks very much. Thanks, Amber. It's very... Um, very good presentation, actually. Um, it's both it's technical as well as information about the ISO. Um, I'm 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 coming. Um, I'm I'm from Vistas, actually. We build and connect wind farms everywhere, even in the US. Um, from where we find, Vistas. yeah, where we find. Um, I'm very interested to know more about the product you're developing for uh, for the ISO. Um, 
um, is it a kind of market optimizer? Is it a planner? Um, what sort of capability um, in the AC power flow that have that covers um, regions? For example, in Australia, we, we're moving to more renewables, um, more integration of renewables on the grid, and we have what's called uh, renewable energy zones. So um, it become a market that not only um, have a problem with the global inertia, but also sub level, maybe local voltage stability problems where planning and curtailment or optimized curtailment has to rely on uh, some dynamic studies and uh, some not, not simplified DC power flow uh, linearized constraints in the calculation, but more of nonlinear and, and integrated with uh, with basically AC power flow analysis. Does the um, the market optimizer that you, your, your company provide to the ISO um, at, at this version or future versions cover that? Or who else other than the um, New England ISO use this software? And very interested to know the capability of this software product. Right, okay. Um, uh, let me see how to answer this without sounding like a sales pitch. Um, <laughs> we can do that offline later. That sounds pretty fun. Yeah, <laughs> but um, uh, but I'll, I'll I'll say this that the um, the the software is very flexible for a lot of different reasons. First of all, um, the uh, different from your question, but worthwhile mentioning um, the 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 day ahead, intraday, and real-time markets are coded up in GAMS, and we make sure to leave our optimization models accessible to the user so that you can change them at, uh, at will. And we believe very strongly in the importance of having um, transparent mathematics as opposed to black boxes that do funny things, and then you try and tell stakeholders what, what's going on. if they, they should have access to the map. So that's uh, that's one thing. The physical power flow can be run as a DC power flow analysis. It could be run as an AC power flow analysis, and it could be run as basically a copper grid, uh, a copper plate with inertia. Um, that was in one of our papers um, several years uh, years back. Um, the uh, you get kind of uh, voltage. Uh, voltage stability as a matter of uh, of course by doing an AC power flow analysis um, in the uh, in the physical power grid and um, and because you can change the nature of let's say the real time uh, market although it's basically a, a security constrained DC OPF in these works uh, you could potentially turn it into um, and ACOPF, if you would, uh, if you'd like to do so, um, using the paper that I mentioned, um, so that that can be done. Uh, that can be done as well. So a lot of different opportunities there. What we what the, what this software does not do is it doesn't do things like transient stability or small signal stability or electromagnetic transients. There are other softwares that exist on the on the market that probably can do that a lot better than ours. Perfect to just have a link to the product. I'm personally interested in knowing more. About yeah, well, that. just email me and we can go. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I think Thea might have joined a bit late, so he didn't get the. Yeah, yeah um, sorry about that. Um, so you wouldn't have seen that slide. So yeah. that's. But uh, in, in the meantime, I've got uh, one question and maybe another one if we've got time. Um, so, uh, Amara, you, you talked about the duck curve and yeah. I'm just, and the you know, what happens at different levels of renewable penetration in a, in a you, you did the studies, if I understand, particularly on the New England system, uh, which is interconnected to neighboring systems, I imagine, yes. as well. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm not sure if it was you that I was talking to about this earlier today or, or someone else, but, you know, when, when you look at the, um, Australia's duck curve, have you looked at um, what we we're expecting, particularly by about 2025? Well, in Western Australia from 2024 to in the NEM from 2025, six, mm -hmm. where our minimum net system load will be getting down to below the sum of the um, uh, 
uh, it's very similar in shape. Yeah. Oh, the shape is, but like um, in terms of uh, where are we, like at what point, can you comment on the, the difficulty of managing the system mm -hmm. where you have to start looking at turning uh, thermal generators off or curtailment and all that? I mean, you talked about curtailment to some extent and particularly noting that Australia is a very uh, skinny uh, continental scale grid mm -hmm. and uh, we're now at 25% wind and solar by energy. And so we're really kind of, I think we're at the bleeding edge of, of all this stuff globally. Australia's at the tip of the sphere. Yeah. It, um, in, in terms of the on the ground facts that need to be addressed. Absolutely. And um, so one, one of the things that my presentation did not address, but is like a huge problem is um, where you put the solar and wind relative to transmission distribution uh, matters a lot. So the so you could do like utility scale stuff, right? Where at least you have the potential for doing curtailment, right? It's not desirable, uh, but any, any utility scale wind projects or solar projects uh, will be required to have curtailment as a possibility because it's just so big, right? But when you have the adoption of uh, rooftop solar PV behind the meter that is not even really metered in the truly observable sense, like you can't differentiate between what is load and what is generation, then you have like a much bigger problem. And so all of this is sort of like transmission level stuff, but the distribution level stuff requires much, much, uh, uh, greater, um, greater effort, greater instrumentation methods. Um, uh, we had an earlier conversation several weeks ago about the Monash microgrid, which I would have loved to have seen um, uh, come about. Um, so uh, I, I think there's a lot of effort that needs to be done there to bring the activation of the, of the grid periphery all the way out to the grid periphery. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, um, but, the, but this, this issue of negative net load is, is a really big operational problem that requires a great deal of coordination at the transmission and distribution level and new market designs along the way because of the coordination is going to be economic. So thanks, thanks, Amro. Just on that point, um, you talk about negative net system load. Yeah. And I think we don't the problems arise well before that when you've got the net system load is less than the sum of all the I min mean, stable levels of all the generating units, which we which is what um, in a when you're talking about a, a whole system, yeah. an isolated system, let's say, whereas yeah, yeah. New England might be okay for a while longer, it depends what happens elsewhere but we we are up against that like in three years in western australia they're up against that like in two years time the swiss right. so have you looked at any studies of what apart from curtailment and uh, people are thinking about doing about that and what the stability implications are so uh what's the problem of turning thermal facilities off well turning facility well minimum off um, in up and down time. If you want to turn off a coal generator, you've got to keep it off yeah. for about eight hours. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's well after the uh, evening ramp when the solar starts to come off. Right. And then what happens uh, when you've turned it off and if a big cloud bag comes along and boom, your, um, yeah. your solar so, disappears. So actually, the, so every, every grid is different, obviously. And I'm not as familiar with the Australian grid, but what I will tell you is that Gosh darn it, is it complicated by coal? By coal or by coal? By coal. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Coal generation. Uh, coal, fire, coal, coal fired generation. Um, so, you know, uh, on, on, uh, on the decarbonization front, we have benefited in the United States by, uh, you know, the shale gas revolution and, um, Several years ago, there was a flip between um, in the merit order of coal and natural gas. And very quickly, coal generation just sort of like 
started to die a very quick death in many places in the in the United States. Um, that's not the reality here for all sorts of other other factors. But um, coal units can't be turned on and off as fast. They can't be ramped as fast, and uh, and so it complicates the the unit commitment their unit commitment a lot. We'll see. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Amro. Please let me, uh, please help me thank Professor Amro M. Farid for his fantastic talk. And um, we hope to see him back here at Monash uh, on another visit. Uh, or you're around for another month, I think, in Australia. Yeah, I'm, I'm here until the end of November. End of November. So I imagine you're happy to keep, take emails and catch up with people who are potentially looking for collaboration. Um, and after that, we hope to see you back I'm here visiting. The way. I'm not hard yeah, to find. Yeah. CSRO Clayton. So please help me thank uh, Amro Farid. Yeah.